Uh, good. Looks like it's working. Okay. So I just wanted to, uh, for projects today, I just wanted to talk about the networking projects. It came up in lecture. And those are extra credit down here because they're sort of uh, review. <coughs> but there's Nmap, Wireshark, and Scapy. So Nmap is here. And um, you can put it on any machine. And so I put it on my Google Cloud Linux server, which is here. And so you can use Nmap. Um, this you can use it even without administrator privileges. You just put it on with apt-get, and uh, so you just Nmap the name of a server, and it will scan it. And by default, it will look for the top 1,000 TCP ports. Now that's disturbing. Now let's take a look and see if I can figure out why this is happening, because my server is um, here. Okay, this is my Windows server at 34, 122, 123, 46. So I'm guessing that for some reason it does need sudo on this system. I did it with sudo and it worked. And it might be that on this system it can't get enough access to the network card without sudo. Um, and it looks like that's the case because it's taking longer. Yeah, there we go. So it automatically scans the top 1,000 most popular ports, and the only one that's open is 3389, which is Windows RDP. And that's, of course, what Google Cloud uses, just like most people do. They use the Microsoft Remote Desktop Protocol. That's what's right here. And all the other ports are blocked or filtered. So it has a couple here, which I recognize. This is a service I actually ran on my machine. These are ones that are closed, I guess because the Windows machine responds. But anyway, they don't, um, this is the only one that's, that's taking traffic. So you can use Nmap, uh, use nmap.h, you can see all the switches, and uh, there's some challenges here you can solve. So you get your Windows machine showing it's open, and then um, you can, here's some useful switches. A will give you, uh, detect the operating system and get the banners from the services so you get more information and you can scan UDP. Here's the one that's really important. Whenever you're doing a CTF or a pen test or anything, you should always do this, scan all ports. It'll take about 20 minutes unless you speed up your scan with these switches. If your network is good and fast and good and reliable, you can speed it up, and then it'll only take about two minutes to scan all 65,000 ports. And so I've got various challenges here where you find more and more hidden services on one of my servers with Nmap. Now, Wireshark is really important. Uh, Wireshark is the tool that lets you learn the basics of networking. So if you, I guess I'll just download this file. It's probably the easiest thing to do. All right. And so you can put Wireshark on any operating system. And then you can just double click that and it will launch it and let you see the recorded packets. And so one way to use Wireshark is to just look at the summary up here and you will see the packets go by. So here's a handshake, sin, synac, ack. Here's a name query. Here's some Dropbox stuff. And if you just scroll down here, you'll see normal traffic. So this is one way to do it, but most of the traffic is just junk background traffic. And here, um, I want to see FTP. So uh, to find an FTP password, the easiest thing to do is just filter. And you can type a display filter here. And it'll turn green when it is legal, if you know what you're looking for. If you don't know what you're looking for, there is a thing here that will let you describe it. Or uh, there used to be a, I uh, huh, guess they took it away. It used to be a sort of wizard that would make it for you. Anyway, FTP is there. And now you'll see a summary of the data. And you can see, please log in with user and password. And here it is, user John and pass flapper. So you see the login attempts just right there. And so um, that's, this is one way to use Wireshark and it's very easy is to just read the summary of the packets, but only for very simple protocols will that work. What you often have to do for other protocols is right click and then follow the TCP stream. And this gives you a nice summary of all the data without all the network addresses and such. So you'll see more or less what was seen on the screen of the person connecting. All right, and so then you've got HTTP here, which is very similar. 
save this and run it and clear the filter. Now you see all this extra traffic and HTTP is in fact color coded with green. So you can see it pretty well there. But anyway, you can clean away the junk with HTTP as a filter. And now you see, get a login page, then get a favorite icon and post something. So somewhere in this mess is a login. And so you can right click and follow the TCP stream. And now you'll see connecting to a server and the response is zipped so it's hard to read. And then something's not found. And uh, so that particular stream doesn't seem to have the login, but there's probably other streams. You can click here and go to the next stream. Here's uh, this one has a login. And is there another? Yeah, there's another one here. This one has a login. So you can see various, um, various streams that way. And that's a good way to like monitor the traffic. Let's see, using Nmap with killer network adapters. Lots of issues after newer driver. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And can we just scan that machine? Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, you can use the domain name for the server as long as it, yeah, that's what you can do. Sure. You can use the IP address or the domain name. That's good. Those are all good questions. Anyways, there's a few things to do to solve here. And then there's one I got from a, um, a capture the flag competition, a red team, I think. Key CTF. And this one here has got advanced resistant threat data in it, or sort of simulated. So there's quite a few different things here. So here, you want to find an encrypted protocol. So you use a little bit of the more advanced features. So if you have a packet capture that's fairly big, then you go to statistics protocol hierarchy. And it will show you all the protocols that were used and you can see what they are. So here's SSH, but there was only one packet, so that wasn't really used much. Here's TLS, that's got 52 packets. And the rest of these are not encrypted, FTP, uh, LDAP, SMTP. So this, it would appear to be the, um, the encrypted traffic. And you want to find the port number of the server of the encrypted transmissions. So you can look at this traffic and you can right click and apply as filter selected. And it will now show you just that traffic. And you can see that it's not going to port 443 like most encrypted traffic is. It's going to 8443. And that is a clue that this is generated by an unusual tool. And of course it is. And so if you go here and now you have to find the tool that's used to find that communications. And uh, there are hints here how to do it. So you can go through and find, uh, they downloaded a tool, they downloaded a, they generated a key and they transmitted it unencrypted over the network so you can get the key and you can decrypt the encrypted traffic, which is really very nice. Anyway, so that's Wireshark. And the last one is Scapey. Scapey is a tool to generate network traffic and it is very nice. Uh, you pretty much have to run it on Linux. Theoretically, it runs on Windows, but in fact, it doesn't run very well at all. So I just recommend using it on Linux. And you can even just um, download it as explained here, and you don't even have to install it. You can run it with Runscapy. It is a Python-based network packet generator. And so now you can First, try a ping. So you create an IP. Let me make this big. Um, Shift Control Plus. I mean, I got to do it up here. Shift Plus. I guess so. Okay. All right. So if I do I equals IP, it creates an IP packet, and I can do I dot display to see what I've got. And it automatically fills in a source and destination of the loopback address, and it calculates the header and the TTL and all that jazz, so I don't have to. And so I can give it a destination. Let's make this smaller. All right. So if I give it that, now if I do the I display again, it has changed the address because now it recognizes that Google is off my network. So it does a net command here, which will do a DNS resolution to find it. 
And then it changes my source address to the right source address for the network adapter that really goes out to the internet. So uh, now it's ready to go. So now I can, that's just an IP packet. Now I'm gonna put an ICMP packet on it. So I create an ICMP packet. And if I display that, an ICMP packet is much simpler. There's not much to it. By default, it's an echo request and all the rest of this stuff is really boring. So I can send a ping with this command, send and receive one packet, the IP packet at layer three and the ICMP packet at a higher layer. And so that sends one packet and then it received one answer. It got 11 packets, but only one of them was the answer. So it ignored all the rest. And this is the answer. And so the answer was an echo reply and it shows you the whole hierarchy. Here's the IP header, which has the source and destination address and other things uh, like fragmentation and TTL. And here's the higher level data inside it, which is an ICMP echo reply. And you can actually put a third layer here, like hello. You can put data in an ICMP packet and then it'll reply with three layers, an IP layer to transmit it to you, an ICMP layer to respond to the ping, and then the data that was carried inside it. And this is why there used to be a tool called Loki that people used to tunnel their data through ICMP to get free service at uh, paid hotspots. So you can run ICMP that way, and then um, there's a flag you can get by sending the right kind of ICMP data to one of my servers. And then there's DNS. So you can create DNS. If I um, set the destination to 1.1.1.1, that's a Cloudflare public DNS server. So I can now make a UDP packet and a DNS packet to go on it. Let's do that much and see how it looks. So if I do d.display, it fills in a query, but it doesn't have any uh, query yet. It doesn't have the information doing. You have to specify the QD, which is the domain, the query you're making. And so this is the query to get the, uh, the IP address of Google. So the query name is www.google.com. And now you see it's a DNS question record asking for the A record of class IN. That is a IP version four is what A is, and IN is the internet address for Google. So I can send that with the same sort of story here. I have an IP packet, and then I have a UDP packet at layer four, and then I have a DNS packet at layer seven, and that's the layers of encapsulation there. So this will send a DNS request to Cloudflare on port 53, and it will get an answer. So here's the IP header of the answer that transported it to me with addresses. Here's the UDP that told it to use port 53, which shows up here as domain. And here's the DNS field coming back. And here's the other DNS fields. It requests, recos back the query. This is how DNS works. If you ask it something, it returns the question you asked and then the answer. And the answer is down here. So here's the actual punchline. That IP address starting with 172 is the IP address of Google. So that's how it works. And then there's a few flags you can get by uh, doing DNS queries to find uh, more and more uh, information about my DNS on my servers. Anyway, so there's, uh, let me stop this recording and then I'll answer some questions.